Oh, hello and welcome. Today I'd like to introduce you to our Archery on Middle Earth documentary. Uh, we'll have people with expertise talking about the archery of the elves, and archery of the Urukai, the orcs, and of course men. Uh, during our documentary there will be people with expertise talking about the various aspects and technical details of the bows and the arrows used by the different races of people in Middle Earth. So I really hope you enjoy our documentary and um, yes, I'll leave you to it and, and enjoy the show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kat. Hi, I'm Lynn, and we're representing the Elves of Tolkien. We're going to read a passage from the Two Towers highlighting Elven archery. Albereth Gathorniel sighed legless as he looked up. Even as he did so, a dark shape, like a cloud and yet not a cloud, for it moved far more swiftly, came out of the blackness in the south and sped towards the company, blotting out all light as it approached. Soon it appeared as a great winged creature, blacker than the pits in the night. Fierce voices rose up to greet it from across the water. Frodo felt a sudden chill running through him and clutching at his heart. There was a deadly cold, like the memory of an old wound in his shoulder. He crouched down as if to hide. Suddenly, the great bow of Lorien sang. Shrill went the arrow from the elven string. Frodo looked up. Almost above him, the wing shape swerved. There was a harsh croaking scream as it fell out of the air, finishing down into the gloom of the eastern shore. The sky was clean again. There was a tumult of many voices far away, cursing and wailing into the darkness. And then silence. Neither shaft nor cry came again from the east that night. The elves are one of the oldest races of Middle Earth. They have developed archery to a fine art. Their ability and prowess with the bow is legendary. Admired by their allies and feared by their enemies, the elf is Middle Earth's expert in archery. Elven bows are the true longbow type, crafted from a single stave of seasoned ash, yew or silverthorn. It takes advantage of the natural strengths of timber and is in keeping in balance with the elves and the world. The bow is of the height of the archer who carries it and can be a little bit longer. This is in keeping with the same methods as men. The skillful crafting of the elven bow gives it a powerful casting ability up to 190 pounds and can be up to 350 yards when firing. They are usually decorated with a filigree of silver, making it a deadly and powerful weapon. Elven war arrows are quite long, imparting a stability in flight that greatly enhances their accuracy. They are made from carefully selected timber, chosen for its lightness, strength and smoothness of grain. Elven arrows are of a modified bodkin type, blade tipped and having a cutting flare at the base. It is guaranteed to cut through any mail, hide or armour it will encounter. Fletchers are made from tapered swan fletters, tri-fletched with the greatest accuracy. They guarantee the accuracy of the arrow over its long flight. Greetings, I'm Lon Shanks from the Brisbane Tolkien Fellowship. I'm also Trevor Wheat. I'm a qualified target archery marshal. Today we are using weapons of deadly force. Do not try and copy us at home. Melo, Mithio Invalid. Hi. Tungo. Hey.
members of the fellowship and our own forces had to face both the power of the Orc and later the Urukai. Similar names, but two different races. From the Lord of the Rings. The chapter, The Journey in the Dark. Now for the last race, said Gandalf. If the sun is shining outside, we still may escape. After me! He turned left and sped across the smooth floor of the hall. The distance was greater than it had looked. As they ran, they heard the beat and echo of many hurrying feet behind them. A shrill yell went up. They had been seen. There was a ring and a clash of steel. An arrow whistled over Frodo's head. Boromir laughed. <laughs> they did not expect this, he said. The fire has cut them off. We're on the wrong side. Look ahead, cried Gandalf. The bridge is near. It is dangerous and narrow. Suddenly Frodo saw before him a black chasm. At the end of the hall, the floor vanished and fell to an unknown depth. The outer door could only be reached by a slender bridge of stone, without curb, without rail, that spanned the chasm with one curving spring of fifty feet. It was an ancient defence of the dwarves against any enemy that might capture the first hall and the outer passages. They could only pass across it in a single file. At the brink, Gandalf halted, and the others came up in a pack behind. Lead the way, Gimli, he said. Pippin and Mary next, straight on, and up the stair behind the door. Arrows fell among them. One struck Frodo, but it sprang back. Another pierced Gandalf's hat, and stuck there like a black feather. Frodo looked behind. Beyond the fire he saw the swarming black figures. There seemed to be hundreds of orcs. They brandished spears and scimitars which shone red as blood in the firelight. Doom, doom, rolled the drum beats, growling louder and louder. Doom, doom. In Middle-earth, the orc used archery primarily as a way of slowing their enemies down and their prey. This was to allow them to close in with and kill them with their blades, axes and their teeth. Several hits, several hits would need to be made to bring the target down. Now, the bow. Orcs bows and arrows were relatively crudely made. Yeah. Large, large orc settlements would seek to make their bows from metal. This was a very difficult task, considering sometimes the primitive state of the orc technology. They were also known to use whatever materials they could scavenge or steal. Bone or wood or shaped horn were not uncommon for the orc. Now the orc bow was most commonly a recurve type, usually half the height of the orc carrying it. This made it very easy for them to carry in confined spaces and in deep underground caverns. But the easy portability had a trade-off. They had a relatively low power and short range compared to the bows of elves and men. Effective shooting range was probably not much more than 50 yards. Now, they're arrows. Will you pass me your bow, friend? The arrows. They shorten size to match the length of the bow that shot them. Ah, as you can see, they are short. Generally made from whatever wood they could find, they weren't renowned 
for their standardisation or sometimes even their quality control. They were expected only to last a couple of casts before breaking. Now their heads were made from basic materials, basic natural materials generally, stone, obsidian or even sharpened bone after you'd finished eating it. <laughs> Fletchers were taken from the birds they caught and ate, generally crow, carrion birds. Sometimes the orc, he couldn't find feather, he would fletch his arrow with clumps of hair or fur, even his own hair, glued down with tar. So there we have it, the archery, the bow of the orc, especially the Moria orc. <laughs> Shoot! Give them a volley. Today our reading on archery will be for the race of men. We are from the Brisbane Tolkien Fellowship. My name is Philip Jackson. And I'm Robin Dynan and we're going to be reading from the Fire and Water chapter of The Hobbit. But there was still a company of archers that held their ground among the burning houses. Their captain was Bard, grim-voiced and grim-faced, whose friends had accused him of prophesying floods and poison fish, though they knew his worth and courage. He was a descendant in long line of Gurion, Lord of Dale, whose wife and child had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. Now he shot with a great yew bow, till all his arrows but one were spent. The flames were near him, his companions were leaving him. He bent his bow for the last time. Suddenly, out of the dark, something fluttered to his shoulder. He started, but it was only an old thrush. Unafraid, it perched by his ear, and it brought him news. Marvelling, he found he could understand its tongue, for he was of the race of Dale. Wait, wait, it said to him. The moon is rising. Look for the hollow of the left breast as he flies and turns above you. And while Bard paused in wonder, it told him of tidings up in the mountain, and of all that it had heard. Then Bard drew his bowstring to his ear. The dragon was circling back, flying low, and as he came, the moon rose above the eastern shore and silvered his great wings. Arrow, said the bowman, black arrow, I had saved you to the last. You have never failed me, and always I have recovered you. I had you from my father, and he from of old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more, lower than ever. And as he turned and dived down, his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon, but not in one place. The great bow twanged. The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast where the foreleg was flung wide. In it smoked and vanished, barb, shaft and feather, so fierce was its flight. With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, smug shut spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high, in ruin. The race of men use their bows for many purposes, sport, hunting and for war. The power of the bow depends mainly on the prey it is intended for. So you get the more moderate pieces for hunting fowl to the more powerful bows for hunting boar, bear or buffalo or dragons. But it is of the war bow we now speak. Men of the West generally use a long bow, similar in fashion to both the elven and medieval type. Carved from a single stave of seasoned wood, it takes advantage of the natural strengths of the timber to provide its power, gyre and action. The bow is crafted to match the archer's height and is car carved to describe the smooth curve from tip to centre section. The string is made from twisted linen or cured gut. The long bow is quite robust and can accompany the archer anywhere they are required to fight. Long bows used by rangers, men of Dale and those of Gondor have a powerful casting ability with door strengths of 80 to 140 pounds. Ranges of up to 300 yards have been recorded.
the arrows. War arrows are made from carefully selected timber, chosen for its lightness, its strength and its smoothness of grain. We have various arrowheads which are in common use. The leaf head, named after the shape of its point. These are for dealing with prey animals, hunting, and for bringing down an enemy's mount. One of these things stops a four-legged animal, generally dead in its tracks. Then we have the general purpose war arrows, the short bodkins, the nail points. Short bodkins good for hide, also will penetrate chain mail. Anything wearing hardened leather or mail is in trouble when these are flying at them. And my favourite, the long bodkin. This beauty has been designed to cut through metal armour, cut through shields, and, unfortunately for my pikeman friend standing here, it will go through chain mail like it's not even there. Fletchers. Fletchers are made from the tapered feathers of large birds, goose, turkey, and the like. They're cut and they're attached to the arrow on a tri-fletched arrangement. Three points. This gives the greatest accuracy in flight, making the war arrows of the race of men a force to be delivered, to be dealt with. Archers to the line. Archers ready. Three arrows at the target. In your own time, shoot. I've been asked to come here today to read from you an account of Urukai archery. These are hard to find, as there are no Urukai survivors after the War of the Ring. The best account is given in the Lord of the Rings book, at the Siege of the Two Towers, the Siege of Helm's Deep. When after the fall of the gates, the Urukai massing storm the walls, they are confronted by a lone figure, Aragorn. I will read to you. At last Aragorn stood above the great gates, heedless of the darts of the enemy. As he looked forth, he saw the eastern sky grow pale. Then he raised his empty palm in a token of parley. The orcs yelled and jeered. Come down, come down, they cried. If you wish to speak to us, come down. Bring your king. We are the fighting Urukai. We will fetch him from his hole. If he does not come, bring out your skulking king. The king stays or comes at his own will, answered Aragorn. Then what do you do here? They answered. Why do you look out? Do you wish to see the greatness of our army? We have a fighting Urukai. 
I look out to see the dawn, said Aragorn. <laughs> what of the dawn, they jeered? We are the Urukai. We do not stop fighting for day or night, fair weather or storm. We come to kill by sun or by moon. <laughs> what of the dawn? None knows what the day will bring, said Aragorn. Get you gone, lest it turn to evil. Get down or we will shoot you from the wall, they cried. This is no party, you have nothing to say. I still have this to say, replied Aragorn. No enemy has yet taken the Hornburg. Depart, or not one of you will be spared. No one will be left to take the news back north. You do not know your peril. So great a power and royalty was revealed in Aragorn as he stood there alone above the ruined gates and before the host of his enemies that many of the wild men paused, looked back over their shoulders to the valley and some looked doubtfully up at the sky. But the orcs laughed with loud voices and a hail of darts and arrows whistled over the wall as Aragon leapt down. The Urukai had two kinds of bows. The first one was a crossbow, a powerful crossbow made from metal. Low fire rate was a powerful but cumbersome weapon, used mainly for besieging fortresses or besieging settlements. Great for that. But while they were travelling, you didn't want a bow that took three minutes to reload. You wanted a bow that you could shoot shot after shot after shot. The other kind of bow was of a long-limbed recurve, mostly referred to as the Urukai longbow. Its large size was due to the physical stature of the Urukai. Long, powerful arms. They were nearly as big as me. Sometimes a draw length of more than 30 inches. The Urukai bow was of composite construction using several different kinds of materials. Sometimes steel all the way through. Sometimes horn with bone in the center. Sometimes horn with steel in the center. Sometimes bone, horn, steel and wood. But whatever, however they made them, it gave the bow a powerful draw with strengths over a hundred pounds commonly occurring. Urukai arrows. Yes, this is their Rolls Royce of arrows. See, the Urukai arrows were made of a much greater size and quality as those from the orc camps. The shafts were carefully selected hardwood, crafted to stand a lot of punishment and taking many, many shots. Arrowheads were made from beaten metal. Yes, just like the men or the elves. You have metal arrowheads. And almost without exception, they were all of armor-piercing types, being made for nothing but war. He's loving this. <laughs> now, the Fletchers. You may think that they're a bit small. But see, the Urukai were taken from large birds they hunted, or from, even in case, slicks of their own fur, mm. held down with tar. Mm. 
you don't lick those ones. But they're a far higher quality and strength than anything generally made for the orc. Krista, my friend, I will show you how good the Urukai bow is. You need to build yourself up a little more. And I'll show you. Yes. My friend, this can be you. That's dead. Oh, hello and welcome back. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our documentary today made by all the members of the Brisbane Tolkien Fellowship. Um, but first, one thing I'd just before we go, I'd like to do a reading for you because not only did orcs and elves and Urukai and men use bows and arrows, but so did the hobbits. The men, oh, this reading, by the way, is from, of course, the Lord of the Rings, and the chapter is The Scouring of the Shire. The men took one step forward and stopped short. There rose a roar of voices all round them, and suddenly they were aware that Farmer Cotton was not all alone. They were surrounded. In the dark of the edge of the firelight stood a ring of hobbits that had crept up out of the shadows. There were nearly 200 of them, all holding some weapon. Mary stepped forward. We have met before, he said to the leader, and I warned you not to come back here. I warn you again. You are standing in the light and you are covered by archers. If you lay a finger on this farmer or anyone else, you'll be shot at once. Lay down any weapons that you have. The leader looked round. He was trapped. But he was not scared. Not now with a score of his fellows to back him. He knew too little of hobbits to understand his peril. Foolishly, he decided to fight. It would be easy to break out. Adam, lads, he cried. Let him have it. With a long knife in his left hand and a club in the other hand, he made a rush at the ring, trying to burst out back towards Hobbiton. He aimed a savage blow at Mary, who stood in his way. He fell dead with four arrows in him. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the participants in this documentary. Um, and of course, I also would like to point out that um, I hope you enjoyed it. All our members of the Brisbane Tolkien Fellowship certainly did. And uh, I'd like to point out also that no orcs were harmed in the making of this documentary. Thank you very much from the Brisbane Tolkien Fellowship and Proudfoot Productions. Thank mm -hmm. you.